Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this very, very special Grand Rounds presentation. It's special for a number of reasons, which my co-introducers are going to share with us here in just a moment. But um, just to make sure everybody's in the right place, this is a joint Grand Rounds offering between the Departments of Neurology and Psychiatry, and this is the Meyerowitz Lecture. I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder by introducing anybody, but I am going to do the housekeeping. The housekeeping includes just a few items. Uh, number one, if you are here in the room, thank you for being with us live. We hope you're enjoying your lunch. We will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's uh, talk, and we'll be moderating that as sort of a joint effort between Dr. Holloway and myself uh, with folks here in the room as well as online. So please do hold on to your questions until the end of the presentation. Uh, if you're attending on Zoom, you are welcome to enter those questions in the Q&A section really at any time, but please know that I will raise them at the end so that our speaker um, can engage us in conversation at the conclusion of today's session. The last thing that I wanted to mention um, is the importance of your completing the survey at the conclusion. There will be a QR code appearing on the screen behind me, as well as I think posted on paper uh, when you exit the auditorium. The purpose of that QR code and evaluation is at least twofold, probably more. One is to give us feedback about our Grand Rounds presentations and how well we hit the mark on our objectives. I think it's gonna be great. I, I do think it's going to be great. But the second is to make sure that you all receive your continuing education credit. That is the only way that we know that you have attended um, and also given us some feedback on um, how we've met those learning objectives. So please do complete that evaluation. Ready for Dr. Holloway? Great. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you, Sapora. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to neurology and psychiatry combined grand rounds today on this incredible, beautiful, uh, sunny day. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce the 2024 Sanford Meyerowitz Memorial Lectureship, a lectureship that's been in existence since 1979, uh, 45 years. Uh, before we move on to this year's speaker, I wanted to say a few words about this lectureship, so we're all aware, and for the man whom it is dedicated, Dr. Sanford Meyerowitz. Dr. Meyerowitz was a graduate of this University of Medical School uh, and was faculty from 1960 until his death in 1977 when he was the Associate Dean of Medical Education. It is a lectureship that rotates between neurology, psychiatry, and medicine uh, to honor Dr. Meyerowitz's many interests and in his contributions to medical education in our respective fields. And it's wonderful, like in years past, to have so many family and friends of Sanford Meyerowitz and Ms. Meyerowitz and family members here who have traveled distances to be here on this occasion. Um, uh, to spend time with us. And we are greatly looking forward to our evening together uh, at dinner tonight um, as well. And it's very clear that Dr. Meyerowitz had a special, was a special person as he had an extraordinary devotion to the medical school um, and his contributions to our respective fields. George Engel, in his remarks at Dr. Meyerowitz memorial service said, quote, in some remarkable way in Sandy's presence, no matter what the intensity of our personal interests and goals might be, we could not be petty, mean, or small. He was an imaginative, gifted person with an incredible capacity to influence uh, people to work together toward common goals and tasks. Uh, certainly that type of leadership is now needed more than ever in academic medicine, and he was a role model we could all aspire to. And that role model befits our speaker this year to an absolute T, who many of us know very well, Dr. Jeff Lyness. I could not be more thrilled uh, to see Jeff, to have him visit with us, and to share some of his thoughts about his new role as president and CEO of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. And I would like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lyness's longstanding uh, compatriot and friend in neurology over 30 years in education and many other venues, Dr. Ralph Josephowitz to make the introduction. So Ralph. Thanks so much, Bob. It's always a, a lot of fun and uh, enjoyable to introduce one of your best friends. Jeff really is one of my best friends. We've known each other for over 30 years. Uh, just a little background. Uh, he's from Flushing, New York. I grew up in uh, Woodside and Greenpoint. He went to Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan. 
Then he came up to Rochester for undergraduate at the U of R and medical school at the U of R. He then went to Yale for his residency in psychiatry, then returned to Rochester for fellowship training in neuropsychiatry and uh, geriatrics. He remained in Rochester until just a few years ago and quickly ascended as a very successful academician, researcher, and teacher. Among his many roles was uh, clerkship director for the psychiatry clerkship. Uh, he was the division chief and fellowship director for the neuropsychiatry fellowship. He then uh, was the director of curriculum for the medical school, and most recently, the senior associate dean for academic affairs at the medical school. He was very involved nationally. He's been involved with the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology for 15 years or so, initially as an examiner, senior examiner, and on the board as well. And we served on the board for a couple of years. I got to know Jeff through the Mind Brain Behavior course when we created our uh, double helix curriculum here in Rochester. We had so much fun putting this together. He ensured there was enough neurology in it, and I ensured there was enough psychiatry in it. And in fact, Jeff uh, wrote a a poster once at a psychiatry meeting concerning our integrated course, and the title was Neurologists Are My Best Friends. And I thought that was really so telling. But anyway, um, in addition to all of those accolades, uh, you know, as you know, Jeff has been uh, president and CEO of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology for the last two years. He's also a very generous individual. He's very honest, sincere, uh, he keeps me on my toes. He's one of my mentors. Uh, whenever I have sort of pressing issues, I don't know what to do, I ask Jeff. And we've been going to Poland, to Krakow, for, oh, 10 years or so. And we always have so much fun teaching the medical students and just sitting around, having a beer, and discussing life. So without further introduction, I just want to introduce uh, Jeff, who I'm very excited he's back in Rochester. And actually, he and I will be back in Poland in May. Jeff. Thank you for that warm, uh, war those warm and, and personal uh, words of welcome. It is such a privilege to be here. Um, I, I'm, I'm nervous that I've talked about this topic a lot over the last year, but uh, in a general way, at least, but it's uh, different, of course, being here. It's really quite moving for me to return University of Rochester being my longtime professional home, as you've heard, and uh, you know the the people, uh, the mentoring, the support, the connections, the experience of people in this room, as well as many other friends and colleagues around the institution, um, that uh, have made pretty much everything in my career possible, including the connections that led me to get involved as a volunteer with the ABPN almost 20 years ago, and ultimately left uh, led to my current role. Um, I also used to be uh, on the other side of the, uh, the Meyerowitz lectureship in terms of the awards committee, and so it's particularly moving to be able to do this as well um, in, in honor of the memory of Dr. Meyerowitz uh, and we're thrilled that the Meyerowitz family and other uh, longtime friends are here as well for that. I will say in terms of the ABPN, which is located in, I'll say Chicago, but it's suburban Chicago in the North suburbs, the, the airways between Rochester and Chicago between here and ABPN have been paved pretty well by lots of people over many years. Uh, former uh, directors, meaning people who served on the board of directors of the ABPN, as Bob Joint used to call it, being on the board of the board. Uh, former directors included Bob Joint, uh, included Ralph as well before me. Um, and as Ralph mentioned, we overlapped for about a year. Um, many others have been involved with the ABPN. There have been a number of recipients of, of uh, education-related uh, award grants uh, from the ABPN to faculty here. Uh, there are many people in the past and many people right now who are volunteering, not this minute, but in general right now, who are volunteering on our test development committees at the ABPN. But I also will say that for the, the majority of psychiatrists and neurologists here, as is true across the country, uh, I think for too many, uh, it's probably true what a couple of folks have said to me in kind of private conversations, which is that the AVPN is a bit of a mystery to, to them or to me is what people said. And you know that's uh, perhaps natural, but it's also a bit unfortunate. And part of what we're trying to do with communications like this, with talking with you about what we're doing is to try to demystify things a bit. I also will say for the many of you here who are not psychiatrists or neurologists, when I talk about certification, there may be some parallels to certification or other aspects of professional self-regulation that relate to your own disciplines. And also we'll be talking about some things that relate to the larger fields of both psychiatry and neurology, which I hope will be of, of broad interest. So 
uh, saying what this is basically a list of what I'd like to do um, uh, in, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, and uh, I guess I might as well just kind of dive in. So um, most of the major specialty boards uh, started forming in the 1920s and early 1930s. We weren't the first, but we were among the earlier boards to form uh, in 1934. So leaders from American psychiatry and from American neurology got together, uh, including representatives from the leading professional societies of the time, uh, including the American Psychiatric Association, the American Neurological Association, the AAN did not exist yet, as I understand it. Um, and they recognized that to do this work of certification, which I will explain more about in a moment, one needs an independent organization to do that. Because Unfortunately, a byproduct of certification is that some people are not going to pass. We don't want to do that, but it's inherent in the nature of certification. What membership organization like the APA or the AAN is going to be, want to do that to their members, right? And yet to have credibility, a uh, certification board needs to be able to do that when they deem appropriate. And so they formed an independent organization, the ABPN, um, which, then, uh, which has been in existence now for 90 years. This is a meeting of that first group. Uh, obviously, one can't help but see that there's a certain, um, what's the word, a certain demographic homogeneity, and I know that's more than one word, um, to the board, although these are, these are uh, leaders from the time. Uh, this is our current board. I'll say a little bit more about our current directors uh, in a moment, but these are the psychiatrists and neurologists who make up uh, our current board, including a couple of faces that are well known to many of you uh, from, uh, from their uh, connections to Rochester as well. Um, and we have been one board. We've been psychiatry and neurology since our inception. At the time of our founding, we were and really have been the only board that's had two primary specialties since its inception. There are a few boards that have since undergone mitosis and have kind of evolved into different uh, primary specialties. Pathology has anatomic pathology and clinical pathology and so on. Um, but we have remained uh, one board uh, during all this time. Um, and I, now three primary specialties with child neurology being a primary specialty in the last, just in the last few years. Why were we found that as one board? I mean, obviously we have the nervous system in common, particularly the central nervous system in common. And of course, historically, as our fields, uh, this is a the very quick tour that will not do justice to history, but as our fields formed in their modern form in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the forms were very close, the, the fields were very closely linked with each other. So borrowing an idea from a colleague at Pittsburgh, you know, I've often shown uh, that, you know, this example. So this person from that period of time was a very famous psychiatrist you may have heard of, uh, if you don't know, his, may, may or may not know his first name. But you know, Dr. Alzheimer trained, among other things, as a psychiatrist. He also trained in neuropathology, a new and growing field at that time, uh, and identified the neuropathology that we've obviously now referred to by his eponym. So Dr. Alzheimer was a famous psychiatrist of the era. And his contemporary, this uh, person was a famous neurologist um, who um, is famous for things other than what we think of as modern neurology because he saw phenomena in his patients that he could not explain with what he learned at the feet of uh, Dr. Charcot and other uh, famous neurologists of the era and developed his, his psychological theories to try to explain those phenomena. So our fields have been closely linked for a long time, but it is true that by the 1930s, they had already begun to diverge uh, in ways that we'll, we can understand in, in the modern guise of our fields, even with all the points of intersection that we have. Uh, it appears, though, that we formed as one board because of those historical links and because together we became one of the very largest of specialty boards. We're still about the fourth largest of all the specialty boards. Um, and so we gain credibility, we gain influence at the larger table in American medicine by being one board. And we work really closely together. Um, we also have to combat similar stigma across for patients suffering from our conditions that are common to both fields and lots of misunderstanding about our fields and the conditions that we that we care about. Well, it must be psychosomatic. Now, don't worry. That's just a fancy doctor word for your brain is broken. Unfortunately, there's no field of medicine that deals with the brain. So even that actor knows that that's bunk. Um, this is a clip from, from 30 Rock, which I have to thank my kids for drawing attention to. And for the younger folks in the room, uh, 30 Rock was a TV show that was on for a while with uh, Tina Fey and Tracy Morgan and others. So, um, so anyway, we work really closely as one board. Uh, our board of directors are half psychiatrists, half neurologists. We work extremely closely together. Um, there has been no, although there have been occasional calls in the literature, and I've heard occasional individuals over the years of my career wonder whether our fields, in fact, 
could, should merge in the future, there's been little formal impetus or no real formal impetus for that either at the board or coming to us as a board. Um, I will say that I think, and I've thought for a long time, as I know have many of you have thought that there are ways to improve cross-training between our specialties, uh, either uh, during training and residency uh, or fellowship, as well as in practice. Um, uh, and uh, there are challenges, often feasibility challenges, to how to implement those things broadly across the country. But of course, there's lots of models of how to do that, um, that people are playing with and learning from. And I know that that's true here. I should be talking to a couple of folks this morning and learning more about even very recent efforts that are, may well uh, prove fruitful uh, in the area of education as well. But let me take a step back and tell you a little bit more about the ABPN and what we do, which really, it all starts with mission, you know, what do we do and why, uh, and people. Uh, so when I refer to we, who are the people we're talking about? So this little schematic is just to kind of remind us that um, really specialty board certification is the only national level recognition of our hard-won expertise in our fields. Right, so medical degrees uh, obviously are prerequisites, but they don't say anything about specialty expertise. Medical licensure, similarly, we're licensed to practice as physicians, not as specialists in a particular field. Specialty board certification is national level recognition uh, of our specialty, and for those who are subspecialists, subspecialty expertise. And so really to put into relatively plain English what our mission is, is to give us in these fields a chance to demonstrate our expertise and our abilities to provide high quality inclusive care uh, for people suffering from these conditions and do it in a way that ultimately serves the public. It's to provide credible reassurance to patients and families and the broader public about our expertise. And by doing that, then we serve the profession by giving that kind of reassurance to the public. In order to be credible, it means, and this is a definition of certification that's not unique to our board, it's not unique to medicine. There's lots of certification boards in many fields. In order to do that credibly, it requires in part at least that the board do its own independent assessments. Not all of it, but some of it has to be done independently. And therefore by design, that's what we do. And this mission is by design complementary to what we do at our academic institutions and our other healthcare systems and other employers of, of physicians and healthcare professionals. It's complementary to the professional societies who provide education and career development and many other things to serve the fields. Um, so we are we fit into that landscape, but we are not doing the same thing as any of those other organizations. To try to explain what, how we fit into things, just to give you a sense of how complicated this is, this slide is barely readable, even if you had it on your own computer screen, let alone projected on on the screen, right? We wind up relating to an enormous numbers of national level organizations, even aside from the professional societies and the academic institutions um, that regulate medical training and medical practice um, and quality of care and so on. It's an extremely complicated and interesting, but really complex landscape that we have in the United States that we're part of. So I keep saying we, who are the we? So we come out of the profession, right? I've already mentioned that our board is, uh, is half psychiatrists and half neurologists, all of whom are board certified in our fields. There are many names up here that are known to, to many of you, including a couple of folks. Erica Augustine actually just joined us as one of our two newest directors uh, as of January 1st of this year, which I'm, we're, we're thrilled about. Uh, and personally, I'm thrilled about, um, but lots of really great people um, from, across, from across the country um, representing not every subspecialty, but a wide wide range of, of backgrounds professionally and otherwise uh, that benefit the ABPN. So the ABPN board um, sets the strategy and makes all this key strategic decisions for the organization, working really closely with our 41 staff members. Um, so I went from an employer of 30 something thousand people at U of R to an employer of 41 people, uh, which actually for a board of our size is a pretty lean staff. There are boards that have two or three times as many employees as we do. Um, and importantly, we have about 300 physician volunteers at any given point in time, experts in our fields who donate their time to uh, devise our assessments and write and vet our questions and assemble our examinations and pick the articles for those doing the article pathway and write those questions and so on. So we, we are the profession, we come out of the profession, um, and, and that's really who the we is when I refer to us. Not new since I started last year, but we put increasing priority on our efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion and communications, which are not synonymous, but really dovetail with each other. And just to give you a flavor about that, so in the area of DEI, we have a board level committee, meaning it's all of our, it's all uh, people who are on our board of directors. 
Um, and our action plan, so I borrowed ideas uh, from, from great people, including the action plan here at Rochester, the, led by Dr. Morgan and, and worked on by so many people here and around the institution. We have an action strategic plan for DEI that's kind of organized under those three broad rubrics. And uh, this is another thing that's probably unreadable uh, from your seats, but my point is if you go to our website, you can call this up, scroll down and look in detail, showing the status of what we're doing with the various goals we've set for ourselves related to DEI to help hold us as an organization accountable for what we're doing. And it shows what we've done so far, what we're working on and what we have yet to do. Uh, and I expect we'll continue to identify more things. Just some flavor of things we've been doing. So in addition to the board level committee, we now have in internal guidance for our examination writers and preparers in terms of inclusivity in test examination questions, patient vignettes, patient uh, vi videos, and so on for our assessments to make sure that we are in taking an inclusive approach. Um, we last year launched a new open process to people. It used to be that people I mean, anybody in theory could ask to become a committee member, but in practice, it was friends of friends. And we're all aware of the advantages and the substantial limitations of that approach. Um, and so we supplemented that in a major way by an open call for applications last year. We got over 200 applications, which was wonderful, way more than we have slots and a great position to be in um, from around the country. And we will be opening that up again this year for people who want to volunteer to do our work. Um, and we've done a number of other things. And in particular, I will mention that we often hold in the spring of each year a crucial issues forum on topics of importance to the board and to the fields, where we bring together representatives from most of the major professional societies and other relevant constituent groups. So that our CIF's crucial issues forums of the last couple of years have focused on supporting and promoting women in 22, um, and supporting physicians from uh, racial and uh, ethnic groups that are underrepresented in medicine um, uh, in 2023 and generated enormously frank and helpful discussion and, and recommendations, both for us at ABPN and for the professional societies for, uh, for folks to bring back to the societies as well. Um, in 2024, we will, won't be doing a crucial issues forum. We will instead be holding a public advisory forum, our very first one, where we're going to bring together members representing different constituencies of the general public, patient and family advocacy groups, for particularly for conditions from our fields, um, and uh, people who advocate for quality and safety uh, in healthcare and so on, and to learn from their perspectives. Uh, and I anticipate that in 25, we will have a crucial issues forum on a topic to be determined. That then relates to our communications efforts, which uh, without dwelling on too many of the details, I will say we understand that communication is at, is at least bi-directional, but usually multi-directional. It involves us trying to convey and demystify a bit what we do and why we do what we do. And it involves us listening and trying to understand what's going on and what people are wanting or worrying about uh, to help inform what we do. Um, and so we've got lots of different stakeholder and constituent groups to be attempting to communicate with. One thing we've rolled out, um, thanks in part to help from folks here, uh, is I realized that we had done, I think, a reasonable job communicating to senior level trainees, residents, and fellows. Here's the nuts and bolts of applying for certification. I think we've done a reasonable job communicating that. But what we haven't done is talk with folks ahead of time about, well, what happens when you're done with training? All right. And how does one think about learning after completion of formal training programs? And how does that then interdigitate with continuing certification, which I will say more about in a moment. So I piloted, thanks to uh, the residency directors here uh, with both the psychiatry and the neurology residents, a Zoom session last year, talking about these things and generating conversation and discussion. We use that to turn that into a couple of videos that are now available on our website to all trainees and to all training directors. And I'm hoping, I don't know that it's happening yet, but I'm hoping that training directors will show these videos or at least use something like that as springboards to discussion in, in seminars, at least with senior level trainees, if not all trainees, senior level residents and, and fellows. Um, so that's part of a whole series of, of videos we've done, short videos, which uh, to try to kind of talk about what we're doing and why, and try to put human faces to what we're doing. Uh, so these are some general messages we have out there. This is the uh, session aimed at, at trainees and, and faculty who, who teach trainees, uh, which as you can see, we titled How to Not Peak at the End of Training. Um, and uh, if you go there, there's both uh, short videos, two 10 minute videos available. Um, and for those who, and that's it, that's playing at one X speed, uh, two 10 minute videos. Um, and then for those who don't wanna watch the videos, there's also transcripts available. Okay, so now shifting gears a little bit, but I've mentioned continuing certification. 
Why is it, I mean, there was a time and, and we were sort of aging out of the profession, but when I got board certified uh, at that time, there was lifetime certification still, meaning you were board certified once, uh, not long after you finished training, hopefully, and then you were board certified for life. Why has that not been the case now for decades? Um, so there's a whole lot of science that goes underneath why we need continuing certification. The bottom line is that expertise in any experts and certainly in, in physicians, it declines over time unless we pay attention to what we're to, to not letting it decline. So I'm not saying it inexorably declines, but it will decline without effort paid. Um, and we all have some sense of this, right? When I speak at a national meeting, I will say to folks, how many of you took an airplane to get here? And most of us raise our hands. And I'll say, how many of you would get on that airplane if I told you your pilot's competency hadn't been looked at since they graduated flight school 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And, you know, of course, nobody raises their hand. So, you know, why would it be different for physicians or, or other experts in, in clinical fields? Um, and it turns out that as important as continuing medical education is, Self-directed, purely self-directed CME alone is not enough, in part because uh, like other experts, physicians, and there is, there is uh, published studies about this, physicians are not very good any more than any other human experts at knowing what we're weak at. We tend to overestimate the things that in fact we're weakest at, which is a pretty dangerous kind of uh, gap to have. So self-directed CME is really important, but it's not enough. Um, so we need to have our learning informed by extrinsic feedback of various sorts. Plus, as I mentioned before, the role of board certification is has to involve, in order to be credible, some level of independent assessments, which means we need to keep doing that because saying someone was certified in 1999 doesn't mean that they are at that level now necessarily, right? We, we need to reassess that. So that's the rationale for continuing certification. And I also will say that it's part of our roles as professionals to self-regulate. It's a privilege to be able to self-regulate, but we earn that privilege by doing it in a credible way. Um, and there are some, not uh, high percentage, but some very vocal uh, folks in our fields, and as in most fields or all fields of medicine, who wish that uh, continuing certification or maintenance of certification would go away other than CME. And uh, they're looking for more autonomy. They're looking for freedom from extra burdens and regulation, which I certainly can sympathize with. But I will say that if we, if we do that, um, we may gain a few years of relative autonomy, but we will lose it again, because if we don't self-regulate at some point, uh, let the uh, government will come in and regulate it for us. Uh, and we've seen that state legislatures, some of them are not afraid to come in and regulate the business of medicine in ways that most of us wish that they wouldn't. And certainly in this regard, we would much rather have this come out of the profession. So that's part of the rationale um, for, for continuing certification. Um, early on last year, I decided it would be good to get something out there in print about this, and I was very careful in picking my co-author. So this was published in the journal Academic Medicine last year. My co-author was Graham McMahon, who is a physician and in internist um, who is the CEO of the ACCME, so the national organization that oversees all CME uh, in the nation. So there is no fiercer advocate for the role and the value of CME than Graham McMahon, and he knows that that's not enough for especially board certification. So it's not just me, it's not just you know the boards that think this, it's, it's other people who've thought about these things as well um, that are leaders in American medicine. And this is not a place for me to get in too much into the details of continuing certification, but I will say everything that we require at the EBPN for continuing certification is in the slide. Um, if this was a talk on CC, we'd spend the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes going into some of the details. Everything you see here, there are options and choices people can make which allow us to try to tailor what we do, because the ABPN doesn't tell us what CME to take or what self-assessment CME to do or what we do for performance and practice projects and so on. And so we can tailor what we do to fit what we actually do in practice and also hopefully get credit for the things that we tend to do anyway, which especially those of us who work in academic centers, there's an awful lot of things we do that count for virtually everything on the slide, other than the independent assessments, which have to remain the purview of, uh, of the EVPN. So that's about continuing certification. Okay, let me keep going here, because I want to talk a little bit more about training and uh, particularly the, some of the subspecialties. So you might wonder, you know, why is it that I'm talking about training at all, right? Isn't that the role of the GME office? Isn't that the role of the ACGME that accredits uh, graduate medical education programs in this country? 
And it, of course, the HC GME does have that responsibility, but we in the board's communities intersect with the AC GME because the AC GME accredits programs. They do not say anything about the individuals that are graduating from those programs, right? That's the role of the boards. In fact, the review committees that review as the residency training directors and faculty know that review all the programs, they actually were formed originally by the specialty boards. And then the boards realized this is turning into an enormous amount of work and really should be an independent organization, which then led to the review committees and then led to the ACGME in its modern form. So we intersect very closely with the ACGME. They set the training requirements for programs, and we determine what are the expectations, what does it take to be a neurologist or a psychiatrist or a subspecialist, and then figuring out what it takes to help people get there to, to be able to become board certified. So let me give you some examples of some of the kinds of things that come up. So I'm gonna start with the small but important details and then start to talk about bigger picture. Some small things that we have um, been wrestling with in the last uh, year or so. Uh, so these are details, but they're really important details for folks in these fields. So for example, for those who are interested in pursuing subspecialty certification in neurodevelopmental disabilities, uh, particularly people who finish child neurology training, our requirements used to say until very recently that you had to be not only certified in neurology and trial neurology, but you had to be certified in pediatrics by the American Board of Pediatrics, which reflects the history of that field when it was founded a good many years ago, but does not reflect the realities of child neurology training for many people today. And so we got requests from people in the field. We reviewed the issue. We discussed it with many leaders of organizations across neurology and with our board, and in the end, dropped that requirement, right? So now, uh, although one's certainly welcome to do rotations that makes, one's el makes one eligible for certification in pediatrics, you don't have to be uh, to become a neurodevelopmental disabilities uh, certified uh, special subspecialist. Another example, we formed a new subspecialty. It's, it's been around for a few years. It was formed, it was accredited, uh, the programs were accredited and people were certified by the UCNS, which the neurologist in the room knows, the United Council of Neurologic Specialties or subspecialties, uh, excuse me. Um, uh, but it became an official ACGME, AVPN subspecialty just a couple of years ago as the field has grown enormously. But the ACGME program requirements slipped in a requirement that the faculty had to include a, subs a, a neurocritical care certified neurologist, there's no problem there, and a neurocritical care certified neurosurgeon. And that is has been an issue because neurosurgery, unlike our fields, does not have a tradition of formal subspecialties. And so almost nobody, and when I say almost nobody, I mean so far two people uh, have gotten uh, from neurosurgery have gotten certified in neurocritical care. So that program requirement is about to make all these programs not eligible to be accredited, which is would kill the subspecialty just as it's really taking off. So we've worked really closely with the ACGME and leaders in neurocritical care um, from many disciplines, including obviously neurology and neurosurgery with counterparts at the American Board of Neurological Surgery and so on. And the long long story slightly shorter, um, is that there's now open for comment proposed revisions to the program requirements from the ACGME that should are intended to alleviate this concern while still making sure that, that trainees in these programs have faculty who are well-trained and appropriate to the field. So we're, we're hopeful and optimistic about that. Um, another example, and this one's not come to fruition yet, but there is an AIR proposal coming. AIR is an acronym that means Advancing Innovations and in Residency Education. It's an ACGME mechanism to try innovative things. And uh, with the shortage of child and adolescent psychiatrists, as is true in many of our fields, but perhaps worst of all in, in child adolescent psychiatry, um, the proposal is to further shorten training integrated training in adult and child and, and or I should say in general psychiatry and child adolescent psychiatry to a total of four years. And so that's coming to us from the major organization uh, in, in child adolescent psychiatry soon we hear, uh, although I've not seen the formal proposal yet. It's an ACGME thing, but the ACGME wants to know that graduates of these programs will be eligible for board certification by us, which is why of course we're involved. And uh, that's gonna raise some really interesting questions, right? So if this can work, well, then why does it take four years to become a general psychiatrist if you can do both in four years? What about the other subspecialties of psychiatry, which are uh, all one-year fellowships? Why can't you become a, a geriatric psychiatrist or a, a consult liaison or an addiction psychiatrist in four years as well as a general psychiatrist? Um, and some of those fields would love to see that happen also. So there's all kinds of 
really interesting ramifications of making a decision about this. And so we promised uh, the Child Adolescent Psychiatry Organization, we've not promised them a particular outcome, we promised them we will review it carefully, keeping these things in mind, and then have to work with leaders in the field to make decisions that are going to have a big impact on the future, not only of that field, but potentially other fields, particularly in psychiatry. The neurology subspecialties um, and neurologists in general, at least obviously you can tell me if you differ, but we are not hearing from neurologists that you want training to be shorter uh, or that you want to be subspecialty trained and general neurology trained in four years. Quite the opposite, actually, is what we're hearing. Um, but in psychiatry, it's a very different story. Um, and so we need to see where that goes. So these are that's examples then leading into some of the larger picture things that we as a board will be wrestling with uh, in the next several years. So for example, in child neurology, uh, there's been a lot of very strong opinions expressed fairly publicly um, by people in the field uh, about how much adult neurology training should there be as part of becoming certified in what we call neurology with special qualifications in child neurology, primary specialty. Uh, how much adult training? Uh, how much training in pediatrics? Uh, and what should the training look like? And are there other requirements and aspects of the field that are not actually currently required as part of training, but are really actually thought to be a good idea? Um, there's also the question, if people are thinking about shorter training, and some people in child neurology are thinking actually about shorter training, but if that shorter training means a lot less adult training, does it make sense to be certified in child neurology alone? or child and adolescent neurology, that's not what it's called now, alone and not in general neurology. And what are the implications of that for the larger field of neurology and for departments and institutions and so on? So uh, I don't know where this is going to go. What I will tell you is that the EVPN is very open to feedback. And as a reasonable consensus emerges from the field, which doesn't mean 100% unanimity because it's clear we're never going to get that. But if we get enough of a consensus from the field, we will want to work with the ACGME to revise our and their requirements to, to reflect what the field needs. And I would say the same thing is true um, about uh, the other uh, psychiatry subspecialties that I've already alluded to, particularly geriatrics and addiction psychiatry are really interested in shorter integrated training, uh, constantly is on psychiatry. There's some mixed opinions out there, but probably would weigh in on that. Forensic psychiatry is not interested in that, um, but you know they don't have to do it even if it becomes a possibility. So um, we'll have to wait, work our way through all of those things. What else do we need to work our way through? Well, there are some national level, I would say, challenges, or I might even use the word threats, in a sense, to the certification industry uh, in medicine, and really more, which kind of are part and parcel of the larger things we see in society about being skeptical or worse about the role of expertise. Um, now, some of this comes from good important places, right? Concerns about wellness, which we all know there's an epidemic of unwellness um, and burnout among physicians, among other healthcare workers, um, and certainly plenty of regulatory burdens on all of us. Um, and there's also concerns about workforce issues from a number of different angles, um, which have led some to conclude that we need to not have, most people don't argue against initial certification, but they want us to lighten or eliminate the requirements for continuing certification, which we don't, we can't do, we can make changes to make things better, but we can't get rid of it for reasons that I've said before, uh, as well as if we want to stay a member board of the American Board of Medical Specialties, which if we, you know, we, we need to adhere to their standards. And uh, if we got kicked out of the ABMS, which we are not at risk of doing at this point, but if we were to get do something so egregious that we got kicked out of the ABMS, everyone in the room who's got a certificate from us, our certificates would immediately become almost worthless. Right, so we don't want to do that to anybody, right? So we need to be adherent to these things. Um, but and I've talked about some of these issues as well. But some of the other things that are going on. So the so-called anti-MOC, anti-maintenance of certification movement, physicians, including in neurology and psychiatry, have been among those quite vocal about this. There are some other boards, uh, quote unquote, uh, alternative boards that offer continuing certification. So I'm not talking about the UCNS, which offers certification in subspecialties that we don't offer. They've been great to collaborate with and synergize with, but I'm talking about in particular, there's a board called the National Board of Physicians and Surgeons, um, which basically says, if you're board certified by an ABS member board, don't bother with all that other stuff. Just come, come get certified by us uh, to maintain your certification. And basically what they require besides paying a fee uh, and having a license is, is CME alone which I've already mentioned why we think that's not, uh, not sufficient by a long shot. Um, and in fact, definitions of certification that are out there, there's all kinds of organizations that talk about this is what certification means. That's not really certification. 
the AMA actually just issued, the American Medical Association just issued a, a, a resolution from their House of Delegates that actually looked at so-called certification boards in medicine and, and rated them in a, in a table, which ones are actually doing genuine certification. And UCNS was fine. Obviously, we and other ABMS member boards were fine. And the MBPS was not. It's not a certification board by definitions of certification, but they call themselves one and, and they have diplomates, quote unquote, that have certificates that, you know, are quote unquote, maintaining the certification. So it's a very challenging landscape um, as, as that example. Um, in Florida in particular, I can tell you that the American Board of Family Medicine, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, but it's something along the lines of revoked the specialty certification of a small number of physicians who were um, providing mis and disinformation about COVID and uh, vaccines and COVID treatments uh, during the pandemic. Uh, this is after lots of due process and giving them these physicians plenty of fair warning and so on, but in the end revoked their certification. As a result, uh, the leadership of the state of Florida is working to try to prevent hospital medical board, uh, uh, medical staff offices from using board certification as a criterion for being on the medical staff. And that's obviously a real problem that, that we think threatens the, you know, the self-regulatory aspects of our profession in all kinds of ways. To be clear, at the ABPN, we don't advocate with medical staff offices that they must use us, but we certainly think that they ought to be free to make their own decisions what they wanna use. And, and Florida is, is introducing legislation to try to, to, to prevent that. Um, and other, some other states have passed legislation. I think the latest number is 10 states now. It started with Tennessee just in the last year or so that given real genuine workforce shortages, physician shortages in their state, they are allowing physicians who are internationally trained um, but not come through U.S. or Canada accredited residency or fellowship programs to not only have a license in their state but to be deemed a specialist in whatever field they trained in in their home country as judged by their the state medical board of the state of whatever it is that that's passing this legislation and we appreciate their real workforce concerns they're trying to address but state by state variation in what accounts to be a specialist is a real problem from a bunch of different perspectives and so we're you know, it's clearly happening we can't prevent this legislation from happening but we need to try to advocate for alternatives to try to address the workforce concerns um, that don't necessarily involve certification by us, because we do require, um, you have to go through an ACG accredited program or, or accredited program in Canada uh, where we have a reciprocity agreement and we don't have ways of recognizing, we've no, uh, there's lots of our uh, diplomates who have international medical degrees. That's not at all the issue. They're, they're wonderful colleagues as we all know here, but they have to have trained in an ACG accredited program to be certified by, by us. Okay, so I've just got a couple things more to say and then we'll, we'll uh, have time for questions and conversations. So things that are on the horizon, even beyond what I've been talking about. So some of you are familiar with the movements toward competency-based medical education, whether it be a medical student or residency fellowship levels. Um, we, there are several specialty boards in a few fields that have actually been advancing this um, uh, in, their, in their fields, so that instead of having timed requirements, you have to do a month of this or a year of that, what they say is you have to be assessed to be competent at this, and if you are, you, you pass go and you go on to the next thing, or you graduate the program. Now, I will say quickly, this, people, when they hear CBME, often think of time-varying training, like maybe you could finish residency in two and a half years, or maybe it would take me eight years to finish residency, and how, you know, how does one plan one's life, and how does an institution plan? For us in psychiatry and neurology, we're not thinking about that kind of time varying training, but we are thinking about how do we help improve the level of assessments in such a way that people might be able to get more individually tailored experiences during training uh, and know that they're coming out with at least you know, the skills that we want, plus whatever else they've had time to spend more energy on. Um, so that's something we're working on very closely with leaders in the fields, including the leaders of the review committees at the ACGME. It will be a long process, I will tell you. The boards that have implemented this in the last year or two all say, we have, we've been working on this for 10 years before we were ready to launch it. Um, so don't expect us to have a big announcement that we're making this a requirement tomorrow. Uh, in fact, the last thing we want to do is require something well before it's ready for prime time. But I think something like this might wind up coming along in the coming years, and we need to see what shape that takes. 
Um, lots of other big topics on here. I guess I will comment briefly on artificial intelligence, which uh, it seems like I went to a lot of professional meetings last year, part of our communications and relationship strategy. I spent, not to, not to whine too much, but I spent 100 days out of the office last year on work trips. Um, and I think every single meeting I went to had some session or sessions on artificial intelligence in our, in our field. Um, you know, the easy stuff for AI for us is have it take care of clerical and administrative, help us with clerical and administrative tasks behind the scenes. The harder thing is how to use AI to help improve our assessments. Can they do a first draft of questions? Can they come up with answer choices? Can they pick articles? Can they um, do simulations that might simulate patient encounters and so on? So there's all kinds of exciting but challenging things to implement things around that. I think the most challenging thing of all is how many of you, uh, physician or not, use AI in some reasonably regular way now as part of your day-to-day -day taking care of patients? So I know this is happening in a number of fields, particularly in some neurological subspecialties. It's going to be all of us in healthcare in the not very distant future. We're all going to be using AI tools to assist in what we do. So what do we do with the board to assess people's ability to use AI in practice if that's in fact what people are doing and should be doing. So these are some really fun things to think about. And we are in the midst as a board of a full look at our strategic plan and revamping it. And so I expect by maybe year's end, very early 2025, we'll be able to talk about some new or expanded initiatives um, that may relate to any of the things you see on the slide or perhaps other things that, that I haven't happened to think of yet, but others uh, smarter than me in these areas can. So um, I really appreciate your attention here. And with that, I think we've got a little bit of time here. So let me open it up for questions and uh, comments. Thank you very much. So, so if someone's going to moderate questions. I'm not uh, sure who's how that's working. We, we've got a we got a plan. But would you like a microphone? I'll start with a question. Um, and then I'll share with Dr. Rosenberg kind of the moderating with the chat and uh, the room. Um, just a question about um, the very few um, and, uh, psychiatry neurology training programs that exist in the country and your thoughts about the need for expanding, contracting, building, growing, or any kind of thoughts on the very few training. We had one graduate a couple of years ago go to UMass that has an you know, neuropsych training program. I just think that given some of the work that's happening in behavioral health integration and functional neurolog neurologic disorders, that's there's a real opportunity to focus training in our combined fields in this really important space. So there are a, a, a number of different combined training programs out there, neurology, psychiatry. There are also a number of psychiatry with internal medicine, with family medicine, uh, and then uh, there are combined programs with pediatrics related to child adolescent psychiatry and so on. Currently, I would say these pr programs are few in number, but few but mighty, right? They serve important um, goals uh, for the people involved at these institutions and in these, uh, the people who obviously get this training. Given uh, pressures to shorten training, I don't know how much these things are going to continue to, to, are going to grow actually, versus other ways of getting there with integrated training as part of everybody's training or, you know, shorter, uh, either fellowship or fellowship-like experiences or something. So I don't know how much they're going to grow, though it, clearly the needs are there that need to be addressed somehow. What I will tell you in terms of, in terms of behind the scenes things is that a few years back, the ACGME decided they were no longer going to accredit these combined programs. And we lost uh, some arguments with them about that because we thought it was their role. We thought these programs were important. So we reluctantly, but knowing it was important to the field, we at the ABPN said we would approve, we can't say accredit, but we approve combined training programs if the constituent programs are accredited by the ACGME. Just a couple of weeks ago, almost taken us by surprise, the ACGME announced, oh, we're going to recredit these, we're going to start accrediting these things again, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and so we're going to work with them carefully to transition the existing programs back into the ACGME. Um, and so then I think we'll need to see, but if there's, a, there will clearly be opportunity for growth in creating new programs uh, under that. Right, great. Right. Few, few and mighty. I like that. Uh, why don't we open it up for a few questions here first, and then we'll kind of ask the, the chat room. You have questions as well? Oh, I've got uh, questions. Great. Okay, well, good. Well, why don't we... 
So terrific, Jack. It's, it's exciting to see what you're doing because really you've making a very interesting uh, area. One of the things is, you know, uh, so you look at emails from the AMA, the main thing they seem to be concerned about is scope creep. And one of the things that the neurologists in practice do is they give lots of uh, time to their nurse practitioner or PA or other physician extenders. And given the threat of decreasing numbers of physicians, I think, which is real, I think, uh, is, do you have any thoughts about how you might, and it's, it's, it's analogous to AI in a way, you're, you're trying to extend the ability of neurologists, but how do you decide, how do you regulate that from the point of view of a, a regulatory body? Thanks. I knew I could count on you to ask an important and challenging question. Uh, it is what you're asking about. Scope of practice is very much part of what I and we have been hearing as part of the workforce concerns that I alluded to very briefly. Um, and I should say, to be clear, I mean, many of you know me well and know this to be true, but for those who don't, you know, uh, working closely with colleagues from other disciplines is essential to sort of everything I, you know, I and I think we do. And yet I think these issues are important. Um, what we think our role is at the ABPN is to advocate for this is what it takes to become a, a board certified specialist or sub specialist as a physician. We have um, extensive and fairly unique training and other requirements to get there. We think it's our role to advocate for our diplomates for what they bring to the table. We do not think it's our role. I don't think it's our role and at the board agrees with me um, to um, talk about what it should take to become a different kind of clinician. I think other professions should self-regulate themselves and establish, if they haven't already, what those things are. Um, and we certainly don't think it should be, I mean, there's been not many, but I will say there's been a few physicians who privately have basically said, why can't the AVPN say, you know, uh, these other disciplines are not a neurologist or not a psychiatrist? We don't want to put our colleagues down. But that's not our role. We can We can promote our own people, right, and what we do. Um, and advocate for the value of that and not be exclusionary to our colleagues in other disciplines. What that means is that really getting at how to, how to navigate that as a, as a field is not just, in, in some ways, not even primarily the ABPN's purview in, in our view. It's really important to figure out how to navigate these things in ways that take advantage of the skill sets of everybody to the benefit of patients. Um, but I think our piece of that is what, what board certified physicians bring to the table. I see Dr. Kane has a microphone. Um, a couple of comments, Jeff. It's so good to see you, and thank you. From a historical perspective, there was a combined psychiatry and neurology training program here. I think it had about two graduates. Um, Alan Rubin may be recalled to some. He ended up in neuro-ophthalmology mostly. Um, it was very difficult because people really didn't feel that the departments themselves were culturally consonant enough to work together. And I think one of the things for the future is really understanding that. Psychiatry residents, of course, as part of their internship, have to take a rotation in neurology. Neurology residents, as far as I know, don't have to take a rotation in psychiatry. And so there are a number of things they, that- They really, do, actually. Do they yep. at this point? Okay, well, then my, I'm, I'm out of date, but that's, that's not new for things. Uh, it's very clear that, that there are different skill sets involved and how to build a common understanding of those differences in skill sets, I think is a, a challenge that goes beyond rotations and goes beyond uh, anything, but pe people literally think differently and models of how to see the same patient, see the same problem and challenge different ways of thinking um, are really areas that will have to be developed if one wants to, do what say I did a number of years ago, like 40 years ago, and move between departments for half time. Um, and that was a, 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 a different era, but a very challenging time as well. Thanks, I agree fully. And those who have uh, been, been involved with me with the, when I was part of the MBB medical student course or other or some other things we did with, with residents in both fields, uh, I've tried very much to talk about at least my version of what I learned in substantial part by working with you and our other colleagues about different ways of thinking. Uh, and, you know, we talk about certain kinds of neurological case reasoning that still, I mentioned it with, you know, early 20th century, but it's still true that certain kinds of neurological case reasoning don't work very well for a lot of the things that our patients, particularly those we see a lot of in psychiatry, uh, suffer with. And so um, how to help people 
understand that and shift where they need to shift to most benefit our patients, I think is a fun educational and, and career development challenge for everybody here. The Linus. Hi. Um, I have a question about the article-based uh, certification, which I find very, very convenient, very helpful. It's different from the, in my opinion, different from the exam in that it actually adds to the knowledge as well as measures uh, what we know. Uh, but I am also intrigued by the fact that there's no CME attached to those. And I'm wondering what's the logic behind that? Uh, well, so first of all, so for those who are not familiar, one of the alternative, one of the two alternatives for assessments and continued cert is the, is the we kept thus far and no plans to do away with the recertification multiple choice exam. But in, as an option instead, there's an article based pathway with curated list of articles one chooses from and then answers questions. And and people, most people, I mean, I hear the spontaneously from folks every place I go, uh, love it. Uh, and I personally enjoy it a lot, although that's not really the main point, but I, I do too. Um, CME though, just to get to that part of that, your question, we're not a CME provider, right? We are, remember our mission, we are not an education organization. We want to promote education, but we are actually not an education organization. We don't, we can't provide CME credits. Um, and so, uh, you know, now some of these articles may provide CME credits through the journals that they come through, but that's very variable. Um, but we have no, we have no mechanism to do that directly. The, the, I will say that those doing the article pathway, as you know, but uh, get credit for other things, including they get self-assessment CME credits waived. So they don't actually get CME credits, but they get those credits waived by doing the article pathway. So we've done as much as we think we can to help it double count appropriately. Um, and most people, uh, particularly people in settings like this, but most people don't have any problem actually hitting uh, the CME requirements that we have in general, which are less than what it takes, for example, to stay on the medical staff here but I, I have been asked that question before. Uh, it's, uh, but yeah, we, we, we can't. We do have a few questions from the online attendees. Um, one is from Dr. Horn, who started his residency here in 1961, uh, working directly with Dr. Meyerowitz. And Dr. Horn's question is, how does the board see, uh, assess competency to conduct ongoing psychotherapy? Uh, and then ended with Dr. Meyerowitz would be very interested to understand your reply. Yeah, I know that I know that that's true. So um, I only sort of alluded to this. So I will expand slightly. Um, we don't think that our assessments. So I remember I said that what we do is in part independent assessments. Um, it does not mean that anybody who sits and takes our exam and passes our exam should be or is a board certified psychiatrist or neurologist, right? So all these things out there about Chat GPT passed this test. In some ways, I don't care, right? At some point, if it's not today, tomorrow, chat GPT will pass our exam, if, although we won't let it get it, but if they did, um, but that doesn't make you a psychiatrist or neurologist. So it's experiences during training where people need to get uh, deemed by their teachers as being competent in the, including in, in the psychotherapy skills that are part of uh, the requirements for training programs at minimum. Um, so, and one must do that. And so anybody who sits for our exams, their training director has to say, has to, among other things, has to attest this graduate is competent to practice and has completed all those requirements, you know, at minimum satisfactorily. Um, in an ongoing way, it is true. We don't get directly at those skills. And imagine what it would take for, we'd love to, but at least with present technologies and resources, what would it take to measure those things for pe in people in practice, how intrusive that would feel to people and how expensive it would be to pull off at scale, right? We've got 60,000 diplomates and guess who has to pay for those costs are diplomates who already, you know, are, are, don't love our fees. So um, it's, it's a challenge. Thank you so much. I just want to mention, we have a couple other questions that we're actually going to take the liberty to email you if you'd be so kind to take yep, a look absolutely. at them. Please, please do. Thank you. Back to Dr. Holloway. And I, I know given the time, um, we'll probably have other questions here where they can ask you uh, on their time. Uh, but we just want to thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for coming back. We are honored to have you back here in Rochester, sharing your, your wisdom and your leadership with all of us. And we're also honored to be sharing the legacy of Dr. Meyerowitz in so doing. So Thank you again for a wonderful talk and we thank, welcome thank you look very forward much. to the dinner tonight. Okay.